All right, hello everyone. Welcome to or welcome back to my channel. My name is Caitlin J. Reeds, and today I I do in fact have a video for you. I know, shocker, right? So last week I was gone. I know. So this happened. Also at a work conference that week it went very well woman in finance work conference it was great all right but we're back here this week with the content for you guys okay and i'm so excited what are we doing today you ask i'm going through some good books that i've compiled some i've read recently some not so recently, some are like my faves, you know, but some are just books that I've read recently that I thought were pretty decent. They had a pretty high rating on Goodreads and reading the one star reactions to those books because while they are the minority, they tend to be the most scathing and the most passionate reviews out there. And I just find that funny, you know? So I, I wanna go through them with you today. Leave a like, comment down below. What's, what's a book you want me to read? I saw A Song in Ice and Fire. A little intimidated by that one. A, a lot intimidated by A Song of Ice and Fire. But, you know, maybe I will do it for you guys. All right, maybe, just maybe I will. Let's, let's ask my library and see how long it takes to get those loans in. But anyways, without further ado, I'm rambling. Let's just get into the video. Subscribe. All right, let's get into it. So the first book I've chosen for today's video is from none other than the Stormlight Archive. If you know me, you know I love the Stormlight Archive. Actually, you probably don't because I don't really talk about it on the channel a whole lot. All right, but I'm planning a reread soon, so that will probably change. And I decided to pick Oathbringer because from what I remember, that is the book that spoke to me the most. I loved that book, all right? And I wanted to see what people didn't like about it, all right? People who didn't like it, what did they not like, all right? So let's, let's just jump in. How to destroy an epic fantasy series in 10 easy steps. Take the most compelling character from the first two books, Kaladin, and make him a two-dimensional background figure. Two, take the most annoying character from the first two books, Shallan, and make her 10 times more annoying. That guy sounds a bit misogynist, shall you say? Yes? Hey, you got my message before, right? Sorry for that quick intermission. All right. Where were we? That sounds like misogyny. <laughs> If I do say so myself. Honestly, Shalon, the most annoying character, that's fucking, that is rich, deep, considering Lopin fucking exists in the series, really. He's, the series is like Jar Jar Binks, right? And you're really gonna say Shalon is the most annoying? <sighs> Let's see how far I can get into this list, because I already disagree. Three, bring the most boring character from the first two books, Dalinar. A long, meandering backstory that never goes anywhere. That is just straight up not true. Dalinar is one of the most complex characters in this story. In this entire arc from when he was, you know, back in the heyday of being a soldier, was capsuled within that book. And it was phenomenal. Okay, it was phenomenal. Dalinar is just 
such a complex character between the, his lust after brutality on the battlefield and then almost being afraid to get to that point now because of what has happened kind of in between to make him change as a man. Just come on, you can't say it doesn't go anywhere, that's a lie. Develop, uh, uh, number four, develop a tumultuous and fascinating planetary ecosystem in the first two books and completely ignore it in the third. Don't remember that. I cannot say or cannot deny. Five, overload an initially intriguing mythology with so many extra details and layers of history it becomes bloated, tedious tapestry of random deities, events, and magic speak. I feel like you're doing the same with that sentence. You're trying to like inflate it with a bunch of fancy words. Um, just say you don't like a long epic complex fantasy and move on. That's okay. He's building, you know, cause that's how a series works. And there's gonna be like 10 books. So, I don't know what to tell you. Six, insert generous amounts of modern colloquialisms into character dialogue to instantly take readers out of your world. I don't remember. Seven, introduce a dangerous and powerful threat at the end of book two, aka the Voidbringers and the Everstorm, then push them to the far background in part three. Uh, from what I remember, there's like perspectives from the Parshendi and such in this and we learn a lot about the Voidbringer. So again, I think this is just, I, I completely disagree with this review and I'm just gonna move on because there are so many points to contend and I feel like I am just completely, completely, I've, I've rested my case at this point. All right, let, I'm gonna move on. It was so bad, I want to feel bad. Oh, it was so bad, I want someone to feel bad. I like that intro. Here's the problem with world building fiction. At some point, the world is built and all that becomes clear is that this author can't write dialogue, lurches back and forth between much too contemporary and much too affected tone, and is not funny. He writes clever characters and gritty scenes like you think a Mormon would. Okay. In prior books, I would grit through how awful all of that was because our little stripling warrior had some depth. But in this book, Cal's gone full Mary Sue. Vas... Vac facilitating, whatever the fuck that word is. Not even my vocabulary is that big, so bravo, sir. Across the emotional chasm of being loved by everyone and being right all of the time, and even complete with a very special episode of the Stormlight Archives where we all learn about tolerance. The conclusion is cartoonishly bad. Darth Odium might as well be called the Phantom Menace. You know what? You know why I know I disagree with your review? Because I liked the Phantom Menace. Just roast me in the comments. I don't give a shit. And I liked it before liking that first one, two, three, or that second one, two, three became popular. Okay? I'm just saying. Anyways, that's, that's, I, I completely disagree. I mean, Again, I might, when I reread it, maybe I'll pick up on some of those um, cadence stuff you're talking about in the tone, but I don't remember that at all from the first book. And from what I've read from his Wheel of Time stuff, I don't see that there either, so. Um, he knew the battlefield like a woman knew her mother's recipes. You know what? I'm really tired of fantasy stories that take place in completely different worlds but can't step beyond sexism. Yes, I'm sure the women will get to prove themselves great shard bearers again too, but it's tiresome to read all the casual sexism like this, a completely unnecessary line of monologue that has to exist along the way. I started out loving the series, but I knew, do not have time for this anymore. Moving on. I included this because I do not remember that quote from this book, but I feel like that's pretty relevant. And I wanted to include a review that... I could say, you know what? Fair enough. I don't remember that. And that's pretty, you know, sexist. But like I said, I don't remember. I just thought I'd include it because that's just an interesting, someone caught that immediately. I didn't catch that. Maybe, like I said, again, I'll catch it on reread, but I did not catch it. And I just find this like valid. So 
Next, we're moving on to a desolation called Peace, which is the second in the Texcalan duology. All right, that's my favorite out of the two. So that's why I chose that one. And we're going to read some one star reviews. That's the name of the game. Let's go. I read this back to back with a memory called Empire. I actually like this book slightly more, but it is so much longer and I fell asleep so many times. This is weak beer indeed. The characters are incompetent and annoying. Half the book is spent following Eight Antidote, who is like Wesley Crusher, but stupider, and heir apparent to Galactic Empire. I disagree. I think Eight Apparent is, or Eight, <laughs> Eight Apparent. I think Eight Antidote is actually a really, really charming character. All right, and I enjoyed reading from his perspective because I was curious about him after a memory called Empire, and we got that much more of him. And I've seen stuff that Arcandy has said, Arcandy, Arcady, and I think we're gonna get an eight antidote book, you know, in the future. But you know, I I'll keep on going. Anyways, the author constantly interjects that such and such character is a genius or has done something amazing. I'm left flipping back a page and rereading as the action is inconsequential. This would have been slightly better as a fantasy, as the sci-fi setting adds nothing. Indeed, the author, author's grasp of physics is so poor, it riles. How actually can you allow an algorithm to allow the laws of physics to be broken and FTL communication take place? You know what? That's probably why they didn't like it. I, I honestly, I consider this duology more of a space opera fantasy in space. I, I personally don't see it too much as a science fantasy, science fiction book. It's more of a science fantasy. You know, light on the science, heavy on the fantasy. She took some liberties. I'm okay with that. This reviewer, he is not. That's okay. You know, that's okay. While I do disagree with a lot of points in this, I do understand how if you really do have a grasp on science and physics that might annoy you, me and my puny little science brain, we don't know that. So we're fine, you know, not not seeing that on the page, but I, I can understand that. I so enjoyed and admire the first book, but after a week of picking up and putting down this one, I quit halfway through. It took me many pages to get reacquainted with the first book. That's not too unusual as my memory is going, same. The chapters are relatively short and from different characters, so things move along quickly. But I think that each chapter at this time, but I think that each chapter at this time, it was too choppy or too short or too little happened for my continued interest. Rats, I was looking forward to this. And the title seems to indicate that everything goes to hell. That's a pretty funny review. I can, I can understand if you can't get it too attached to the characters. I felt like the pace was okay for me. But I can understand if it's too fast for other people. It is a pretty fast paced book, in my opinion, you know, for a uh, sci fantasy. I'll coin that. I'll coin it. Failed to capture the absolute seething rage a person feels during colonization. It was shallow and sidestepped a complicated issue. Both characters are despicable if you take the point of view of the colonized. It's an easy read and I think it's highly rated because it's decent and acceptable. A accessible. It's not actually good. Again, another review that I thought had a valid point and I wanted to include in this video. All right. I am not someone who's dealt with colonization in my own personal life and I, I don't know the deep nuances of it. So, and I can only guess that the fact, you know, the first book is pretty much pitched as like, what if you fell in love with the empire that was like oppressing you? So I can only imagine maybe it doesn't do the best representation for that. So I wanted to include this review up here because I felt like it was valid. And for the same reason I included that Oathbringer's valid review, I'm including this one because we love different perspectives. Next, I'm moving on into Swan Song by Robert McCannon. And I chose this one because it was published in 1987. And while a lot of the plot did age well for me, uh, I would say about 20% of, of the book really just mm, grind my gears every time it happened. You know, let's do some trigger warning right now. It has some very stereotypical depictions of people from minority groups, all right? Very brash language is used, very brash. 
and towards the end, very, very brash language is used. And also, what else was there? Oh, sexual assault, essay, 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 um, multiple times. Uh, the almost um, actual multiple times. So, all right. And without further ado, let's hop back in and let's read some one star reviews of Swan Song. Uh, I almost never stop reading a book midway through, but I have to put this dog down. It's shamelessly derivative, the characters are wooden and unsympathetic, and it is so riddled with logical inconsistencies as to be unreadable. Yes, there's magic in stuff, but that's not what I'm talking about. Okay, there's been a nuclear holocaust and survivors are still wandering around, scavenging, etc. Halfway through the book, it jumps seven years ahead. The survivors are still wandering around, still eating hoarded cans of beanie weenies, despite the fact that the world is still dead as shit and locked in nuclear winter. What has the horse been eating for the past seven years? Spam? Who's been refining new gasoline for the Mad Max Brigade? You know, <laughs> this is a pretty funny review. You know old gas goes bad, right? No, no. After the umpteenth eye roll, I can no longer continue suspending my disbelief. I've got better things to do with my time than to waste it finishing this wretched ripoff of the stand. That was actually a very funny review. And I can understand where he's coming from. I, I can. Um, I think humans are resilient, and the whole point of the story is to show human resiliency in all forms, uh, good and evil. But I do get where this guy is coming from. Is it a little unrealistic that this many people would be thriving after a nuclear holocaust? Probably not. But I still enjoyed the book, alright? But pretty funny review, in my opinion. I wanted to like this book. I like novels about how the world might be after an apocalypse. In spite of all of this, what I perceived as shortcomings and being just bad in what seemed to me an amateurish sort of way, I continued to the end. There was too much of everything. Violence, torture, death, cruelty, starvation, disease, cancer, nuclear devastation, nuclear winter, nuclear pollution, and nuclear effects. Was there not a nuclear holocaust? Right. Anyway, people killing each other, themselves, and most other living things. Racism and ethnic cleansing. Okay, I can get down with that one. That rubbed me the wrong way too. I, I get it. Magic and fantasy, both dark and good, was mixed in. I like that. Good versus evil. The devil, a main character, was a mean, cruel, but not too cunning shapeshifter. And luckily for the good guys, a not too bright idiot, or no one would have survived. And, of course, a Madonna-like figure was also there to represent good and save the world. That is, if she can make it through all of the above and then vanquish the devil by just being her sweet, smart, innocent, and meaningful self after the cancer crust falls off of her beautiful face. Sigh. Has this author heard of the concept of less is more? Maybe I'm just jaded from reading great books <laughs> like The Road, The Stand, Oryx and Crake, The Hands Made Tail, and even The Dog Stars and The Hunger Game. This book gets four plus stars for most readers. Just not for me, I guess. All right, some of this I can agree with. That cancer falling off the face and just revealing beauty or ugliness underneath, I get it as a literary tool, but again, unfeasible. All right, not feasible, just not feasible, not something that can happen. How many times can I say the word feasible? Okay, agree. Did we need to see so much racism and ethnic cleansing? No, all right, no, okay? That's pretty obvious, all right? But besides that, I found this to be a compelling interview and pretty fun to read aloud, alas. DNF, after the un... <coughs> DNF, after the utterly unnecessary essay 300 pages in that took the book from entertainingly incompetent to creepy and gross. This is a terrible book. Again, another comment that I just wanted to push up there. Because like I said, 
There are multiple encounters with SA and it disturbed me. Just how casually it was just thrown in there. There are so many other tools we can use to display the sinister nature of the sinister side of this book, but it shows that it was written in 1987. There are no punches pulled. Shock value all the way. Like I said, take the book for what it is. I did and I enjoyed it, but I totally get what this commenter is saying. Next, we're going to do a Wheel of Time book. And some of my favorite Wheel of Time books are the, that middle group, all right, that everyone hates. So I decided to choose book number nine, Winter's Heart, which I really enjoyed. I really love following around the Aes Sedai and some of the smaller characters, I guess. And I wanted to read people's passionate reviews about why they disagree with me, all right? Because I, I find it fun. I read these books as they came out many years ago, waiting for each after book number five. Good for you. That was hard enough, but when I eventually got to this one, I was halfway through and simply couldn't go on anymore. This despite the sheer fantasy brilliance of most of the earlier books, despite developing saint-like patience as the gaps between releases grew exponentially like this man didn't have cancer, despite riding with a smile of desperation through chapters, nay hundreds of pages at a time where nothing more than the most banal, banal, banal internal monologues were given center stage. I enjoyed that. Anyways. When I began to wonder if I even remembered anything at all about the plot or anything of substance about the main characters, given they were hidden behind a curtain of extras big enough to conceal a small city, all of whom, <laughs> that was a good one, all of whom are presented with such enthusiasm and intrigue, you're forced to devote some precious last scrap of your mind to remembering them, their ridiculous name, and figuring out why on earth they've taken this long to appear. It's hard not to let the feeling that the author doesn't actually know how to push the story forward and is in fact terrified of attempting to do so, opting instead to lose himself in everything except which is most important. Interesting take. Interesting take. Do I disagree? Yes. But it's because I, I want more books. Quite honestly, I just finished A Memory of Light. And uh, quite honestly, I feel like the books Brandon Sanderson are associated with, mostly 12 and 13, are beyond rushed. And that's because he set a very meandering pace with a lot of backup in these beginning books, and most people hated it, but I enjoyed it so much that I really, I liked the last couple books, but not nearly as much as I liked the middle books. The last book was epic. But that's honestly, it was because of the battle. It's not because of Brandon Sanderson's pace. And like I said, I really didn't like the way he paced out those, especially 12 and 13, but the rest of them, I really enjoyed the pacing. But I, I think that's an interesting take on, you know, why people don't like it. And I can see that, you know, I can see how people have different opinions than me. It might flip flop. So that's interesting. Finally done. The ending was okay, but I didn't care for anything that happened up to that. There are just way too many characters, but at least there was more Matt and barely any Perrin. I can barely remember anything besides Rand's love triangle, and that was so cringe. Didn't remember there's not a lot of Perrin in this, but it's probably Matt and Tuon in this, which is why I like loved it so much, but you know, that's fine. Of all the books in the Wheel of Time series, this one is one of the most significant for several reasons. Most of it not good. The final few chapters of the book were genuinely exciting and actually moved the plot forwards due to the events that transpired. Sadly, that is the only good thing about this book. Disagree. The rest of this book is just filler that does nothing to advance the plot. None of the characters are any closer to their goals by the end of this book, with the exception of Rand. Everything else, save of the final two chapters, were just pointless description of women's dresses and teacups, etc. Misogyny. Why Jordan's editor did not tell him to cut it out is beyond me. It's because it was, it, was, it was his wife. <laughs> if I stand corrected, that's why. Perhaps he was being paid per word? It took finishing this book to realize that Robert Jordan was not a good author, since a good author does not prioritize describing useless things and introducing pointless extra characters over the plot. Disagree. It was this book that put me off the Wheel of Time series disagree. 
disagree. He just has a slower pace, and that's okay. All of this background filler builds, all right? And we needed more of that building, in my opinion. But I, I appreciate that first line. It's mostly significant for several reasons, but not. But it's mostly not good. That's funny. This was a book where I threw in the towel on the series. I know I am probably in the minority on that. I really, really liked the series for the first four to five books. And then after, it was all downhill. By book nine, I feel like the characters have all become so hateful that I was pretty much rooting for them all to die, particularly the women, who quite frankly are horrible. So alas, this is where I decide to go off the ride. Okay. It's a journey, people. It's a journey. I feel like this person maybe has never been depressed and angry. That's all I have to say. And it's been a pretty long video. I hope you enjoyed yourself with me today. I actually enjoyed myself reading those reviews. Like I said, one star reviews, those people are passionate about why they don't like the book. And some of them were just gold. They had nuggets of literary genius in them. One review a word I couldn't even pronounce. Looky there. So bravo to you, whoever you are. But yeah, this is Caitlin J. Reads. I hope you enjoyed today's video. Give it a like. Comment down below. What was your favorite review and why? Okay. And subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. We have 127 of you here with me today. So thank you. All right, let's get me to 130. That would be truly amazing. And I would thank you all so much for doing so. So, goodbye. I will talk to you on Friday.